It's good to see you all here today. Uh, we're back in the book of Genesis. We're going to go through chapter 5, the line of Seth. As we saw last time, we looked through the line of Cain, uh, the one who was a murderer. And we saw all the various things that were done. And this week, we're going to go through the line of Seth. And I know many of you are really fans of those long lists of names that are hard to pronounce. And so we're going to go through one today. And it's, it, it's funny because there are some commentaries that don't even comment on chapter 5 because it's very repetitive and it's just a bunch of names. And yet we understand that the Word of God is very intentional and it's put there by God for a reason. And so as we look at it, I think there'll be things that you may learn from it. If not, perhaps you should fire me and find someone else. Well, I know you wouldn't fire me because, you know, you don't have the ability to, but other people might. That's okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we so need you. We so need you to open up our eyes, even as worship opens up our hearts and our emotions and reminds us of who you are, Lord, and who we are in you, that you're our living hope. I pray, Lord, that you might speak to our hearts and our minds today as we look at your word and we wouldn't just see it as a bunch of names. But Lord, it would be a testimony of the things that you are doing and that you are leaving here for us. So help us, Lord, as we come into this, Lord, having a, a hunger for spiritual things. I pray that you might speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're back in the book of Genesis. If you remember last week, we went through the line of Cain. It was Cain and Abel were the first two that were born. And of course, Cain, seeing the sacrifice of his brother Abel, was jealous and angry because his sacrifice was accepted by God and Cain's was not. Cain brought fruits and vegetables and the work of his hands. What Abel brought was a sacrifice of blood, which is what God required. And it appears as though they knew this. Because setting the example early on, God shed the animal's blood to cover Adam and Eve with garments. So we see that he wanted to worship his own way and he wanted to worship in his own works. And boy, that's like every other religion other than true Christianity. It's about being good enough and producing enough good works to outweigh your bad works so that you don't go to hell, but you go to heaven. And that's the way most people understand the economy of uh, heaven and hell. And we know that it's not that way at all. The only way that we can go to heaven is if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and his sacrifice on the cross for our sin. That's it. There's nothing else that we can produce with our hands, even as Cain attempted to. As we, as we looked at it, there were curses that came because Cain sinned and there were additional curses that struck the ground. If you remember, he was a farmer and so his work was contaminated. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that because there's some secret sin in your life and you're not hurting anyone that that's the case because you always hurt people with your sin, not just yourself and especially God, but everyone around us is affected and the curse spreads out. He cried out and said, oh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a horrible, terrible thing. I don't think I can bear it, Lord, to be separated from you. Well, that's what it's like to be separated from God and our sins separate us from him. And he said, it's, uh, it's too much for me to bear. And he begged for God's mercy. And it's interesting, God showed him mercy. Even Cain, a murderer, he warned him beforehand. And he said, hey, Cain, what's wrong with your face? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will your countenance not be lifted up? But if you don't do well, then sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to have you. You must rule over it, which is a great reminder for every one of us that we have a choice to submit those things before God so we can make right choices instead of wrong choices. So we saw the line of Cain, every one of them. Cain is the begotten possession, and uh, there was a lot of hope on behalf of Adam and Eve in naming him. And so he was this begotten possession. It's like, God gave me a man. Maybe this is the one that was promised in Genesis 3.15, that there would be one who would come and crush Satan. And yet he gives birth to Enoch, which means dedicated Irad, which means wild donkey or, or a, a fleet or fast wild donkey. Mahujael, blot out the Lord is God. So you could see there's a lot of deep 
anger and atheism towards God in the naming of their children. Mahujael, then Methusael, which is they are dead who are of God. So you get the idea that there's this degrading, pervasive, sinful behavior that's going on even after the building of a city called Enoch. And so this is the picture of Cain's descendants doing what they're doing. And then Lamech, who is despairing. So there's this sad line, a family line. I don't know what your family line looks like, but my, my family tree's all broke. So I praise God that Jesus Christ can come and intervene and begin something new. Amen? Amen. And he can do it for you as well. And so we looked at Lamech. Lamech, who's the first polygamist. He marries two wives. We know from the beginning this was not so. Jesus actually reaffirms this, that there was one man and there was one woman, and that's what constitutes a marriage for life. And so we looked at that last week as well. I, I don't know how you do that and introduce somebody to your missuses, but <laughs> Jesus tells us that you know marriage is for a lifetime. It's not just for a season. Um, the rabbis thought that if you saw another woman that was better suited to be your wife, that you could divorce. And yet, um, Jesus said that is not the case. And so he begins to be prideful and talks about how he killed a man. It sounded like queen to me. But he, he killed a man. And it, it's interesting because his son is the, the maker of weapons. And I just wonder if he wasn't using his son's weapons. But anyway, that's a whole Jewish tradition thing. But he murders somebody for hurting him, like bruising him, uh, which is an overreaction. And it's just endemic of what's going on with this race of people, this line in Cain, where people just take things into their own hands and they do whatever it was that they think should be done. And that's false religion. And so we see, he says, you know, uh, if anybody's going to mess with Cain because God put protection on him, nobody's going to mess with me because it'll be 70 times seven worse for them. You can't institute God's judgment on people or, or God's protection on people, but he did anyway. So we looked at that last week as well. And then we see some new people added to the line. We see Seth, who, gives birth, uh, who has a uh, son whose name is Enoch, and, uh, that which, Enosh, which means mortal. So we saw all of this last week, and Eve's expectations were met because Abel had been killed. And so now you have this um, substitute. And, and it's interesting because uh, his, his name actually means uh, appointed, which means he's an appointed uh, replacement. You know, like if, if somebody was taken out of a football game and you put in their replacement, uh, that's what Seth's name is. So he's kind of living in the shadow of his dead brother, which can be a difficult thing to, to, to buy by. You'll notice in the Old Testament when the law comes through Moses, there's a thing called a Leverite marriage. Any of you got married in a Leverite marriage? Any of you? Well, here's the deal. You, a husband dies, leaves a widow, and you as the responsible brother in the family have to marry her and make children for her. You guys are aware of this, right? You look a little astonished. To continue the family line, and it's interesting, I wonder if it comes from here. Because you've got Seth, who's this appointed replacement, who's kind of there in place of Abel. And it's, it's interesting, he's kind of carrying on the line instead of Abel. It's rather interesting. So this week, we're going to look at two family trees here. We've got the line of Seth, and we've got the line of Cain. We already looked at the line of Cain. And we see it doesn't seem like there's a good one in the bunch. And as you go through, we're going to see as we go through the line of Seth, there are a lot of differences. First of all, their names are going to be different and they have different connotations. And instead of looking at a big giant long list of names, I figured we'd go through it one at a time. <laughs> and this is the book of the genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. He created him male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So it's kind of like a restart here in chapter five. 
goes all the way back. It says Adam was created, and now they're, they're going to focus on Seth. The entire scripture does this. You'll notice it talks about all these people, and it singles one out. And it talks about all of these people, and it singles one out. You have somebody like Moses. You have somebody like Abraham. You have somebody like Joseph. You, and as Jacob, Isaac, you have all of these, and the Lord kind of puts his finger on one person in this generation, and suddenly we find out why, because it all traces down to the family of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And so this is where it begins, all the way back at Adam and with Seth's line. Adam means man, as you guys know. Actually, it, it has a root, which means red, which is probably the color dirt God chose. So we're all dirt bags. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> Seth, Seth means appointed, and so that's what their names mean. So this is going to be the family tree of Seth, which you're going to see is a whole lot brighter and more optimistic than Cain. It's a different family tree that will now take root, one that does not have a murderer as the progenitor. You realize that Cain was the murderer, and all of his kids came after him, and so those are all the children of a murderer. And you figure, what kind of an upbringing are they going to have? That's why they created Dyphus. So there's a second tree, a second family tree. Isn't that interesting that there were two trees in the garden, and now there are two trees outside the garden. These are family trees. And there's a choice of which one you're going to come from. I want you to take note that they're counting years. By the way, there are some that have tried to say, well, there must be a, a, a huge mistake because people are living extraordinarily long lives and they must mean months. And there are people who try to reason that away. But some of these guys would have children when they're seven and a half years old, eight years old, nine years old. So that wouldn't work. So the months don't work. The years are literal. It really means this. And this is all pre-Diluvian before the, this is all before the flood. They lived extraordinarily long years. It's just the way that it was. And then we're going to see that they get shorter and shorter as we go to the next chapter, chapter six with Noah and the flood. But they're counting years. You'll notice with Cain, there was no counting of years. There was this guy, there was that guy. That, and oh, there was one other, there was one girl that was mentioned, Meaka. So they didn't mention how old they were, how old they were when they had children. They didn't mention how long they lived. They didn't mention when they died. Isn't that curious? You ever notice that? Oh, that's the part you skip when it's all those long names. <laughs> you got long lives before the flood and this gradual erosion, you'll see lives begin getting shorter from this point. The likeness of God is handed down, but it's marred by sin. And so it says that when Adam gave birth to Seth, he gave birth to a child in his own image. Isn't that interesting? Adam was truly a son of God. And we know of one other the only begotten son of God, who was Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. But we see Seth, who was created in the image of his dad because he's a copy. You ever try to make a copy of a copy and then make a copy of a copy? And a copy of the copy that's a copy? That's exactly what's happening here in the book of Genesis. And lives begin getting less and less. Note also that these men are representative figures and not the totality of those living at this time because it says that Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness. After this, his image was Seth. So there, after this, there are other sons and daughters that are born to them, but they're not mentioned. God does this entirely through the scriptures. He singles one out and it's kind of a representative. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, by some accounts, by the time that the flood comes, there are billions of people on the earth. I mean, if you could live to 969, how many children do you think you could produce? <laughs> After he begot Seth in the days of Adam were 800 years. And he had sons and daughters. Notice that, but they're not mentioned. And so all the days of Adam lived were 930 years. And he died. I want you to notice, and he died and he died. You're going to see for every one of these guys, it says, and he died. And he died. And he died. And he died. Every single one of them. It's, it's designed so that we look at that and say, wow, this is really sad. It's like a giant epitaph of all these names. I thought it was worse just having all these names. Now it's, they died. How cheery. I'm so glad I came to church today. 
930 years and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. And, at, and he begot Enosh. Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. Notice they're not listed. And so all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. So we have these human beings that came, they lived, they died. 930 years, 912 years. We know, we know uh, Seth means appointed and Enosh means mortal. So you get the idea that now there's death that's on the line and guess what happens? They realize human beings die. I don't know if you ever remembered the first person that was close to you who died. I remember when I was young, I, you know, I didn't know anybody who had died. Now that I'm older, I know a whole bunch of people that have died. I got lists and I got stacks of like stuff I got at their memorial or their funeral. Lots of people. And you begin to understand your own mortality as things go by. And it's interesting, Seth announces in his son's name that man is mortal, that we're not going to live forever in this state. And yes, death has defi definitely taken hold and it's part of our life. In Genesis 3, 4, you may remember, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. When God said in chapter two of Genesis, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Or dying, you shall die. In dying, you shall die. Which means instantly there was, there was a separation between man and God. Spiritually, there was a spiritual death and a connection that was lost because of disobedience. But there was death that was now introduced to the world that ultimately ended in death. So there was an immediate and there was a long-term death, both of them because of sin in the world. Hebrews 9.27 says, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Just in case any of you thought maybe you'd get reincarnated, the scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die. There's no recycling of human souls into butterflies or other things or <laughs> consciousness. You become one with the universe. I'm not sure what that's all about, an, an eternal being stoned or something. You know, that's the way it's painted. But it's appointed unto men once to die. We get one shot at this and that's it. There's no place where you're going to make big rocks and the little rocks and work off your sin because you're not qualified to do so. Only Jesus was. And he grants it to us as a free gift for it to be received, not to be rejected. People don't go to hell because of their sin. They go to hell because they haven't accepted the forgiveness that's offered through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what sin it is that you have. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. He died. In case you were wondering, he died. Enosh means mor mortal and Kenan or Canaan as it's spelled here, that's probably a better spelling, is sorrow. So now you have mortal who dies and you have sorrow who dies. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because death has come to all men, and all men have sinned, death comes from everyone, comes from everybody. There's nobody who's going to be uh, an exception in this room. Well, Canaan, in verse 12, lived 70 years and begot Mehaliel. And begot Mehaliel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. No surprise. Mechaliel means the blessed God. It's interesting, you don't have, you don't have all of these uh, anti-God names. You have these names where God is actually incorporated into the memory or a humility that human beings are mortal and that there is sorrow in our lives. Well, Mehaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared and begot Jared. Mehaliel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. And so the days of Mehaliel were 895 years and he died. He died a little younger at 895, which is still a good long life, nothing to complain about. 
but he died as well. Jared means shall come down. You can see that there's still a hope of a Messiah who would come and rescue them from the power of sin, that the earth would be restored, that people's relationships would be restored. And so there's a hope. And so they name him this kind of hopeful name, shall come down. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. And he begot, after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and he had sons and daughters and so the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch means teaching. And you guys probably heard his name before, Enoch. You guys know who Enoch is, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 24 says, Since by man came death, so by man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die... Even so in Christ, all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the father, when he puts an end to all rule, all authority and power. Notice there are three gradients. There's Christ in the first fruits. There's where Christ comes back for his own. Then there's the ultimate when he takes all the chips off the table and everything gets made new. There are three stages right there. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But notice everybody dies. Enoch, Enosh rather, lived 65 years. He begot Methuselah. How many of you heard of Methuselah? Methuselah, because everybody wants to live long, right? Methuselah. And he begot Methuselah. Enoch walked with God 300 years and his, had other sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch, Enosh were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. The exception to the rule. Hmm. And he took him. Where did he take him? Great adventure. I'm going to Disney World. That's not too far off. He took him. Here's what I think is the earliest picture of the rapture, boys and girls. Took him. In the New Testament, we use a word called herpazo, which is a forceful taking up of. It's interesting. We know that they died, they died, they died. We get to him and it's, oops, no death for you. And his life gets cut short. Something happens when he turns 65 where he has this revelation, he has this relationship, this born again experience. But because of that, the Lord says, well, it's such a long walk home. Why don't you just come home with me? And he takes him to heaven. That's unusual, isn't it? Because the Lord took him and he was no more. Nobody could find him. He was gone because the Lord took him. Why would the Lord do such a thing? Well, he was probably good enough. No, that doesn't work. Because we're all sinners and fall short, right? Why did he do it? I think he did it so he would put a footprint in the sand that we would be able to look back and have a hope for our own redemption. The first indication of a rapture. Methuselah means his death shall bring. His death shall bring what? His death will bring a tree in the middle of town because that's what will plant him. No, his death shall bring. That's just what it means. It's scary. Hebrews 11 verses five to six says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, the def definition of faith, it's believing what God says, believing what God says to the point where it affects what you do, where you go, how you speak, um, what feelings you allow to be harbored in your heart, what thoughts you think, the things you buy, where you drive, how you spend your time, what your schedule looks like where you choose to sit here this morning. 
I'm just trying to get your attention. He was not, for God took him. The word for took is to take, to get, to fetch, to lay hold of, to seize, to receive, to acquire, to buy, to bring, to marry sometimes, take a wife, snatch, or take away. God took him away. It says because he had faith. Is that not your hope? Because I have faith in Jesus Christ and my life has been given to him. I have faith that he will take me home at the appointed time. He was a man who walked with God and that was the testimony about who he was. I don't know what, what sort of thing you're gonna have on your tombstone, you know, like, you know, born this date and a dash and then died this date like the rest of these guys. But he's got no, he just has the dash. <laughs> he just has a dash, born, dash, and the Lord took him. I'm, I'm wanting to get on that bus. How about you? Amen. Not that I'm worthy of it. In Jude chapter one, we actually get a word from Enoch, who uh, means teaching. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, he's talking about false teachers now. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. Who's the Lord come with? I'll read it again. <laughs> Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. Who does the Lord come with? Saints. And who are they? Us. Yes. Thank you, Enoch. To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, if you had to find one word to describe those false teachers, ungodly, right? Because he it, it, it repeats it. It's, it's a teaching thing. And that's what teachers do. And Enoch was that. We know of one more that was taken away just like this. Elijah in 2 Kings 2.11, very good. And it happened as they continued on and talked, that's Elisha and Elijah, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So it's interesting in the book of Revelation, you're going to see that there are two Old Testament saints that show up as witnesses and they get killed and left in the street. And then publicly they are resurrected and ascended to heaven. Could it be the two that never died would be the ones who would give testimony. Hmm. Could be. It's just something for Sean to argue about later with me. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, 51 to 53 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, that's us, must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Flesh and blood, dirt bags, will not inherit heaven as we are. So God will have to change us. And aren't you glad? I'm due for a change. I've got some pains and aches and all of that. I, I can go for a change. First Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18 talks about the Lord coming back as well. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We're supposed to spout scripture to each other and encourage one another with these words. Like, hang on, the race is not too far and the, the, the finish line is not too far away. Amen? You guys read the news? The world's gone crazy. Putin's moving nukes. We know that the world's going to get destroyed by fire. We just don't know exactly how. But I think I have an idea. Are you ready to go home? Are you ready to face the Lord, the king of the universe? 
I am, as long as Jesus is my <laughs> lawyer, I'm good. So Methuselah lived 187 years and he begot Lamech. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and he had sons and daughters. So there are others not mentioned. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, but he died. 969 years. His name means his death shall bring. Guess what happens the day he dies? The flood comes of chapter 6, which we're, we're coming up to. I'll show you a chart when we get there. When Methuselah dies, the judgment of God comes. And his name says so. Enoch knew what he was doing when he named his kid. It was a prophetic name. Judgment's coming the day I die. But can you, can you imagine... <laughs> Methuselah is your dad. You say, hey, dad, you're, you're getting kind of old. You all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. All right. Well, don't do anything crazy. Because when you die, it's all going to fall. So, you know, you want to make sure he's well protected and cared for. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing. I get the idea that he was looking forward to uh, going to see the Lord. What does it mean that Lamech who is the last generation before God's judgment, what does it mean that Enoch was taken and Lamech lived the longest life of everyone? Because Lamech, when he dies, judgment will come. God is showing his patience in the long life of Methuselah. And I think this is a picture. Enoch gets taken, harpazo, he gets hauled away, right? And he gives birth to a son. And his son is Methuselah, who has the longest life of anyone showing God's long suffering with human beings. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You just thought it was a bunch of names. He gives birth to Lamech. It says in 1 Peter 3, 19 to 20, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Speaking of Jesus, speaking to those in, the word is Caruso, he preached to those who were being held. In other words, he announced his uh, authority and his winning, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering, that's a word for God actually, the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. You guys know what eight symbolizes in the scripture? Eight symbolizes new beginnings because you got one through seven, and then eight kind of starts like the eighth day of the week, like the Beatles tell you about. <laughs> the eighth day of the week is actually the new week, right? Sorry. <laughs> eight souls. And by the way, there are eight descendants on each of Cain's line and also of uh, the, the righteous line of Seth. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. In other words, he's not forgetful. But is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everyone who would come to come. And that's why you have this extraordinarily long life of Methuselah, because the Lord is being patient. And aren't you glad? I'm, I'm glad that the Lord didn't come, you know, 35 years ago. I would have been lost. The grace of God is displayed for all the ages to come as we look at the lives of these people and we see Enoch being taken away and we see Methuselah living up to the very time when God brought judgment upon the earth. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. You see the hope in his name? After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and he had sons and daughters and all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. Lamech means despairing, and Noah means rest or comfort. 
they're thinking Noah's going to, you know, he's going to do us good. He's going to bring us grace. Maybe he's the one that God wants to come and stomp out onto the head of Satan and make things go. So you see this constant hope in this line of Seth looking for a Messiah, understanding man is mortal, man is going to have sorrow, and yet there is a hope that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. Enoch had faith and walked with God to the point where he just took him home. And he gave birth to Methuselah, who was the longest living life. You know, we're living in the life of Methuselah. This is God's patience, not wanting any to perish. So they name him in this hope. And so here's this line. You've got Cain's line, which we talked about, which are basically a picture of the flesh. There's, you don't find out how old they were when they gave birth, how old they lived to. You don't have any of that because basically their lives are all wasted. And yet you have this righteous line and there's a remembrance of who they had and their children and their names and all of that. And basically everybody dies all the way up to the end. And we're, this is all in preparation to get to chapter six, which is Noah and about how God is going to have to wipe everybody from the earth. And it's a giant reset. Last verse. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He waited a long time. We're not sure if Shem, Ham, and Japheth were triplets, because they're all mentioned together. Usually, the oldest is mentioned first, but not always. Sometimes they're just preferred uh, because of their line. And it's interesting because from these descendants come every human being on the face of the planet. Everybody else gets wiped out. So whatever plans people had of choosing the line of Cain and saying that they were certain races or certain people, it's a bunch of baloney because they're all gone. It's a big giant reset button. It's from Shem, Ham, and Japheth that everybody proceeds. And it's interesting. Genetics will show you that. That's why you can go on uh, whatever.com and you can find out where you're from. You know, you take a blood test and they check your DNA and all that. They can find out where you came from. If you didn't have a common ancestor, you wouldn't be able to do that. But we persist in thinking evolution is true. And yet all the science that contradicts it is what we use to find stuff out. So anyway, sorry. I, I think out loud with my mouth wide open. <laughs> Forgive me. So this is the line so that you can see it. You've got Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech. And finally, Noah, who has Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So that's what it looks like all the way up to the boat. I want to show you something. The names, Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enosh means mortal, Canaan means sorrow, Mecheliel means blessed God, Jared means shall come down, Enoch is teaching, Methuselah his death shall bring, Lamech the despairing, Noah, means rest or comfort. If you put these all together, you get a sentence that reads something like, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching and his death shall bring the despairing rest. When you think that the Bible is just a list of names, I want you to remember chapter five, which some very famous Bible teachers don't even have a commentary on but with a little bit of research in each one of these names, this is what it spells out. Do you see why the line of Seth is considered a righteous line? Because from that line comes Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, who came to die for our sin. He's the one who came and put his heel to the serpent's head. He's the one who has won victory for us. Amen? Amen. Next week, we'll talk about other things. Two trees. I don't know what your family tree looks like. Doesn't matter. I know some people, it looks like a telephone pole. <laughs> Mine looks like a giant bush because you've got divorce and remarriage and you've got all these people you're kind of, sort of related to. And 
It's like everywhere. I know that I am blessed by God because Jesus Christ saved me. I gave up. I stopped running and said, I give up. I need a savior. And I knew that Jesus was the one. I know that he is the one that came from God. He taught everything perfectly right. He always spoke the truth. He never, he never hedged on it. He always did it in love. He always did it for the benefit of whoever he was speaking to. I get to be in that line. You get to be in the righteous line of Jesus Christ because to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to be called the sons of God. Sons and daughters. It's mankind after all. I hope you guys are encouraged. I hope you are confirmed in your faith that the word of God is true. Every word of it, not constructed by man because man couldn't do this. But God does. Him you can trust.